Hi, I'm Jan Ozer. I'm chatting today with Reinhard Grandel, VP of Product Management at Bitmovin. We're here to talk about Bitmovin's inclusion of AI in its analytics package, and we'll also touch on AI and live captioning and super resolution. Reinhard, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Let's start with analytics. Um, what motivated your decision to add AI to analytics? So first and foremost, when uh, we talked about AI and the usage of AI, we always wanted to create something useful for our customers. Um, we are not big believers in AI for the sake of AI. So there needs to be a benefit for the user. And one thing um, which is pretty obvious when you look about uh, modern video analytic systems is that you can lost, get lost in data pretty easily. Things get complex, things may require a certain understanding of video workflows, which are very complex nowadays, and accessibility is a topic. And uh, you don't want to become a video expert first to understand uh, what you can do better for the sake of a better streaming experience of your users. And that's how the idea of a session interpreter in our analytics product was born. Okay, is this machine learning or generative AI? This is machine learning. So it's based on, on data, on models that we feed ourselves, and uh, they interpret a session of a user that uses or that was captured with our analytics product in simple words. And it not only summarizes the session, but it also gives you actionable insights and recommendations, how to do things better, how to do things more favorable for your users. So what was the learning process like for this? Um, it was a learning process from the very first step, from the beginning. <laughs> what are the models that you use? What are the services that you use? How do you uh, work and interact with AI? Um, that's something which I think every technology company needs to learn uh, in the beginning. And we got better and better. And then it's obviously also tweaking um, the model to understand video streaming to a certain extent and to make sure the information that it uh, derives out of those massive amounts of data is useful to the users. Um, there is no benefit in uh, an AI interpreter tells you that the user watched the video for X minutes. That's something you can easily uh, see yourself from a simple graph. So it's more than that. It's a combination of different data and information. And I think it all comes down to asking the right questions. So when you talk about machine learning and training, what was the AI related training interval for that? Is that a matter of months? Is it a matter of weeks or days? Or you know, give me a feel for the scale it took to get, you know, essentially we're going to look at this in a moment, but essentially you're turning data into useful uh, information for the people who use your service. How long did it take to train the AI uh, models to be able to produce that? It is, and it was a matter of, of months for the initial setup. Um, but I have to be honest, uh, I think also some uh, delay was introduced by us and we learning to deal with the technology. And um, I also have to say it didn't stop yet. So every session we interpret, every uh, piece of data we look at makes the model better. And it's a continuous learning process also for us, but uh, same as for the model. And um, in a year from now, we will be even be better in interpreting sessions and giving recommendations as we are now. Okay. I, I was going to ask that later. Is this a model that gets smarter for an individual customer? So if I'm using this and I'm ABC company, does this get smarter and smarter based upon my data or is there is a general uh, algorithm for, for lack of a better word that's applied to all bit moving customers it's rather the second uh, for now and uh, for the sake of uh, having an introduction it's with all our products we like um, to enable all our customers with the best possible experience but uh, having said this it would also be able to be trained and uh, optimized for individual customers. We don't have uh, such a case yet, but that's definitely a possibility, possibility and uh, one of the logical next steps for us. Okay. 
So to, to kind of summarize before we, we look at it, the benefits that you're delivering via AI is, is basically turning raw statistics into understandable information. Why don't we take a look at that? Sure, happy to. Um, let me briefly share my screen and bring you into the uh, Bitmovin dashboard. So that's a basic um, view of our dashboard that uh, each and every of our users can access. So there is no secret sauce uh, in my dashboard that you can't see uh, as, as a user. Uh, it's just looking at demo data and we are already in deep in our analytics product in what we call session tracking. So we are looking at uh, anonymized um, sessions for um, uh, a specific video. And if we look into a specific, specific session, we see a session visualization and also a nice and shiny button called help me understand. And that's where our AI hides behind. And now in real time, it analyzes the data on the session. And as you can see, you get an output of the session with a short summary, um, a few words, how the session um, was taking place. And then we already jump into the analysis, which I think is the most uh, important part. Um, look at the engagement, the quality of experience and the quality of service. Those are the three categories we uh, use for a standing session and then last but not least our recommendations and based on the data that uh, our session interpreter uh, had to look at for these sessions um, we derived or it derived at two recommendations which uh, would increase the quality of experience for your end users okay and this is this is customized to the specific data that's being shown for that production so it's going to change for every production based upon that data exactly so it changes for each and every individual session every individual session is different has different issues has different problems but also has different potential how to make it better and in this special case um, there is a need to reduce the video startup time and uh, also apparently the network conditions have to be adjusted or vice versa. The video quality has to be adjusted to varying network conditions. So that could be an, an issue of the ABR, for instance. And those are exactly the recommendations we want to provide to our users because that's what gives value to an analytics product, in my opinion. The data is one thing, but doing something with the data, being actionable and making things better based on the data is the key to success. I can see that being very useful. What's your sense of the additional load it would take to get generative AI working to make this information interactive so a user can say, what does this mean? And you can come back with an answer. Is that on the roadmap or is that just too too big a hill to climb in the short term? No, I think that's exactly where we have to go. I mean, that would be getting towards a more natural way of interacting with it. I mean. Um, I see it as uh, also an extension of our own support team. That would be something our support team would be asked, uh, what's the session, how can we make it better? And then the natural ways to interact, to say, okay, how do I do that? How do I do that better? Uh, I have a question about the startup time, about startup latency, what can I do? So I think that's exactly where we have to go uh, with this feature. And that's also what we are currently planning um, in our, in our roadmap and with our development teams. Um, the unfortunate also is that uh, things can happen very quickly or also take some time uh, with those uh, types of new technology. So I can't give you a good estimate, but um, our teams are on it and I'm fairly confident that they can enable that rather sooner than later. Is this a service or is this something that people can download and run on their own hardware? This is a, a service and uh, purely a service due to its nature and its architecture. We also need uh, the performance of certain services in the background. And uh, that's why we run it uh, in the cloud together with our analytics. But the good news is you don't even have to enable it. Uh, it is enabled uh, by default if you agree um, to our AI terms and it is available to each and every user. Any price difference from using this or is it included in the base price? No, it's included in all our packages because as I said, we really believe an analytics product or the value of an analytics product is defined 
by making things better, not only by showing data. It's providing useful information as opposed to just data. What about at the back end? Are you running this on GPU instances in the cloud, or is this a small enough model or small enough inferences that you don't need special hardware to run it? This is uh, lucky enough, uh, small enough to run on our standard infrastructure. So no um, need for, for GPU processing. So this is uh, all based on, on CPUs in this case. Okay. And we already talked about this is not something a particular user can customize to their own data at this time. Maybe that'll come down the road. You didn't, you didn't say that I did. <laughs> um, why don't we move on to captioning. So what are you doing with AI and captioning that you're going to be showing at NAB? Captioning is a, a huge topic for us and so many of our customers uh, are dealing with uh, a problem around captioning that it's a, a very resource intense job uh, to provide captions and there are a lot of regularities uh, for good reasons to provide captions to enable also um, a vast majority to enjoy certain types of content. Um, and especially when we come to a live event or live streams in general, um, it gets uh, a very, very difficult problem or it can get a very difficult problem. So with the launch of our live streamer uh, last year, uh, we also thought already about adding nice benefits and features regarding closed captioning and auto-generated closed captioning. And at this year's NAB, uh, we are happy to show that uh, we can uh, run auto-generated closed captions based on Azure Cognitive Services together with our live stream. So that means um, in real time and without any further delay, uh, we would prepare the audio track in a way um, that we can send it to Azure Cognitive Services and uh, get a, a text file out of the audio track. Then we apply some magic to make sure it also fits the timestamps and uh, aligns with the audio track and then feed it back into our encoder to create a, a web VTT file out of that. And uh, here we go. We have uh, automatically generated closed captions for live streams. And I have to admit, and I was very impressed because it works also with my dialect very, very well. So what's the latency that someone should expect from a service like that? Latency is, of course, a topic uh, like for, for all uh, life-related services. But if we talk about uh, broadcast latency, there is no impact to the overall uh, latency of the stream. Um, so we're talking about um, less than, than one or two seconds overall. Uh, the good thing is that the processing can and does happen in parallel to the video processing itself. Okay. So what is that? When you say broadcasting, you mean the typical 10 to 15 seconds of latency? Yeah, so around eight to 10 seconds. Uh, there is no difference if you turn it on or off. So that's not an issue at all. Um, we will get into lower latency scenarios probably later this year where we may have to tweak the one or the other thing, but as mentioned, uh, as it uh, is architectured in a way that it works in parallel to with the video encoding. And we again use the scalability of the cloud and of our solution. Uh, it doesn't really hinder us or there is no downside of using it today. Okay. And that you're, you're plugging into an Azure service. This is not AI that you implemented in-house. No, exactly. We are working together here with uh, our partners from Azure and uh, they generated uh, the model and trained it very well. As I said, it works uh, stunningly well. And it also has the benefit uh, to enable further use cases on top of that. Um, closed captions or subtitles uh, may also need to be translated in various different languages to make the content uh, useful in different regions. And that's a, a nice feature you can get on top of that. Okay. How many languages does it uh, recognize on the way in? At the moment, I think we are limited to a few and the most common ones, uh, but I would have to look up the exact number. But uh, as the trend uh, is definitely uh, growing and Azure and Microsoft investing a lot in um, their AI ML uh, services, uh, I expect that to be the most common languages in no time. Okay. And is the translation real time or is that 
the uh, translation the then on top of it would also be in real time or with a minimal minimum delay that wouldn't influence the delay of the entire video stream any further. Okay, and that there's going to be a fee per minute or a fee per hour for that. Yeah, exactly. So that's uh, what uh, we currently figure out in a few um, proof of concept deployments. And there is obviously then also the cost of the cognitive services uh, in addition to, to our encoding solution. Okay. Let's talk about super resolution. So who, who cares about super resolution? more people than you would actually think. So uh, I was also surprised when we first introduced uh, Super Resolution to the market and uh, tried to get a response. It resonated very well because there is so many and so much older content out there, uh, which is still valuable and um, content providers or service providers are a little bit afraid to use it because the quality is simply not matching the expectation of what people um, want from a service today. I mean, maybe talking about assets that are 20, 30 or more years old. And if we can bring that content back to life in an acceptable quality, even talking about 4K or uh, even HDR, that is very, very powerful and a very, very um, important asset for providers. And that's exactly uh, where super resolution enters the stage uh, because with super resolution, you have now the power and, and you are enabled to make this content uh, work in, in an environment in 2024. You just mentioned HDR. I mean, how does that work? I've got a, you know, a, a DV file that's 720 by 480 and it's 8-bit mode. How do you get it up to 4K HDR? Good question. And there we get into uh, detail very, very easily. And I have to admit, I'm not a, uh, a video expert myself. Uh, the only thing I know and I can explain, we're talking about very, very smart ways of filtering stuff <laughs> and upscaling stuff in uh, all kinds of directions. And it is uh, actually super different for every type of content. And uh, that's also where machine learning uh, can help us to pick and choose the right algorithms, the right filters uh, for the right content types. Okay, is this a VOD or is this a, a live or both? That's at the moment and the way we approach it, uh, a VOD thing, because usually for live events, there there is not this downside of, uh, of a bad quality. We see live events being uh, shot in 4 or 8K, even with very high quality. So there is less need for it, although there might be, be edge cases and workflows where it is very valuable, um, but uh, we are focusing our efforts on VOD at the moment. Okay. So how much of this was homegrown and how much of this was open source technology or third-party technology? It's um, part, part. I can't give you a, a, a fixed ratio because uh, as I said, um, the technology we use depends very much on the content type. And uh, we trained models ourselves also together with Athena, our research institute at Bitmovin, uh, where we have very good models for certain type of content but uh, there are also other companies and partners out there to do a really good job on other type of content. And as we want to provide uh, the best possible outcome to our users, we would pick and choose the best model, the best technology uh, for the type of content. Okay, so you're going beyond, I mean, you can only scale video from any resolution to any resolution. You're obviously the super resolution that's AI based is gonna deliver better quality than that. Do you have anything you can show us? I do have uh, a few images already that I can disclose. There will be uh, more to come uh, at NAB, but uh, let me briefly give you some insights uh, on, on what I'm talking about. So for different types of content, for instance, if you look here uh, at the upper part of the, of the video, at the text that you see on the sign, um, the right one with super resolution is obviously much clearer and um, the same holds true also for for colors and um, for the depth of a video. If we look at the face of the woman, for instance, in this frame and uh, same holds true for this one. So these are only just uh, screenshots, but it highlights a few possibilities that we have. 
and I said different content and different content types um, just require a different way of approaching it. So how do you train this? So we use uh, different types of content and uh, for all the content, we try different angles uh, with different methods. And then the question becomes how you measure the result. Um, there is one possibility that we do where we're using VMAF scores, uh, which works uh, decently well, but um, most of the time we don't only trust into VMAF because we want to uh, really make uh, or really compare the perceptual quality. So there is no way around golden eye tests. How do you do that though? A lot of the automated VMAF testing I've seen with super resolution is you start with a AK image, you scale it down to 1080p and then you apply the super resolution and then you compare it to the original image. You don't have an original image. So what are you comparing to when you're measuring VMAF? So for um, the parts where we don't have this 8K uh, file or this super resolution file, there is no possibility of doing that. So there uh, you only have to rely on golden eye test, but in the training phase where, we, where you can train with content, where you actually have um, the high resolution or high bit rate or high frame rate or whatever um, quality file, there is the possibility to also use uh, more objective scores like VMAF. How is this priced? At the moment, this is not priced at all because uh, that's a feature which is coming out of our uh, Innovate Slab uh, freshly, um, but there will be an additional factor um, to the encoding most likely. Um, I cannot uh, disclose what it will be, but uh, it will be marginal in contrast to encoding because in the end we want people to encode uh, more content and that's uh, how our business model works and not um, uh, not charging a lot of money for, for the upscaling. Okay, are we going to see something like this as it relates to frame rates to upscale from 24 to 60 or something like that or is, is that not on the horizon? Likely, likely uh, not included in uh, version one, to be completely honest and transparent, but um, I think uh, high frame rates or frame rate in general is also an important factor of uh, the quality of experience for the end user. So it uh, makes natural sense to also invest in, in upscaling when it comes to frame rates. Okay, that's all I have. Listen, thanks for taking the time today, Reinhard. I know you're busy getting ready for NAB. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it was nice talking to you. Looking forward to see you at NAB. You too. Take care. Thank you.